Hi, good morning. My name is uh, Xavier Bresson. Um, so first, I would like to thank the organizers of the workshop on graph presentation learning and beyond for their kind invitation. Um, so I'm going to talk about benchmarking graph neural networks. And this is a joint work with my students, Vijay Dwivedi, Chaitana Joshi from NTU, and my colleagues, Thomas Lorraine from LMU and Yoshua Benjo from Lina. So graph neural networks, uh, GNNs, have become the standard toolkit for analyzing and learning from data on graphs. Uh, there is a growing list of um, applications, uh, including chemistry, physics. So Kyle Kramer will give us you know, uh, a talk about physics and graph neural networks. Um, there is also um, recommender systems, social sciences, knowledge graphs, neuroscience, computer vision, NLP, and combinatorial optimization. So actually, there has been a decade of developments of uh, GNNs, starting um, in 2009 with uh, Scarcelli. And then there has been, um, to my opinion, three waves of uh, GNNs. The first wave uh, focused on extending neural networks to graphs. The second waves tried to design better nonlinear uh, non-aggregation equations. And the recent third class um, design theoretically expressive GNNs. Of course, what we want is to develop a powerful GNN for real-world adoption of graph deep learning. So how do we track progress? Uh, so uh, the good news is that the field has grown extensively in the last three years. Um, but evaluating the effectiveness of new ideas and new architecture uh, has become difficult for two major reasons. So first, we, as a community, have been evaluating programs on small data sets. And on small data sets, um, simple and complex architecture may give you the same performance. Even worse, um, architecture with no graphs can sometimes give you the same performance. Uh, we, as a community, have not rigorously enforced standardized experimental settings for fair comparisons between GNNs. So today it has become critical to solve this issue if we want to develop a powerful uh, GNNs. So uh, what we want, we want to identify and quantify what type of architecture first principles are universal, generalizable, and scalable to larger and more challenging data sets. And to do that, benchmarking is a good solution. Um, so for example, in the community, in our community, uh, the 2012 ImageNet challenge has provided a benchmark data set that has triggered uh, the deep learning revolution. So for, for GNNs, challenges are developing a rigorous experimental setting for fair comparisons and being reproducible, using data sets that can statistically separate model performance and benchmark distinct uh, fundamental graph tasks. So here's the outline. Uh, of my talk. So I started with the motivation, then I'm going to introduce you uh, two classes of GNNs, so message passing, West failure on layman uh, GNNs. Then I will introduce data sets, infrastructure, and experimental settings. I will report the benchmarking results. And then I will introduce Laplacian positional encodings and link prediction with edge representation, and I will conclude. So, Message passing graph convolutional neural networks, so MPGCN, um, are the most popular uh, GNNs. So what are the minimal inner structures you need to design a message passing node aggregation function, FGCN? Okay, so, so how do you go from the node representation I at layer, at layer L to the next layer? So you need this function to be invariant with respect to node permutation. You need independence with respect to graph size and neighborhood size. You need locality. Um, you also want graph convolution operations. So basically, you want to do weight sharing across graph. And, and you also would like linear complexity with respect to the number of edges, which is going to reduce to uh, the linear complexity with respect to the number of nodes for sparse graphs. Okay. So if I want to satisfy all these uh, properties, at the end, uh, well, so my update function uh, will depend on the representation at uh, the node i, the previous layer, and all the neighbors, so all the neighbors uh, of uh, the node i. 
Okay, so it's not uh, we, we don't have a lot of freedom. The only freedom that we have is the design of this function, but the input of the function will stay the same. Okay, so <clears throat> the first class um, uh, we designed was uh, what I call uh, isotropic GCN. Isotropic GCN, so here you have, for example, graph sage, update equation. So what you're going to do is that to, uh, to get the representation of the node i at layer i plus 1, what you're going to do is that you are going to use the representation uh, at the node i multiplied by w1. And then you are going to use uh, the neighbors of i, so the, the j, uh, that you multiply by the same weights w2, because it's isotropic. So all neighbors, they will receive the same weight. So these models are, for example, vanil vanilla GCN, graph sage, and uh, Chebnet. But, but we are limited by the isotropic property here. And, we would, and remember the standard convenets, so they produce anisotropic filters because, you know, a grid um, have directional structure. So we know where is up, down, left, and right. Uh, but for the, the, the original GCN, we, have, we just use graph. And if you use a graph, you have no notion of direction. Uh, you don't know where is up, uh, down, left, or right on graph. Okay, so how do you get back anisotropy? Um, so you have two options. You can use natural edge feature. So for example, um, between two, two uh, atoms in a molecule, you may have a different kind of connection, like a single bond, double bond, or aromatic bond. Or you can learn anisotropy you know, with a mechanism uh, that can treat neighbors differently. Uh, for example, with Monet, Getty GCN, or GAT. So here is the... Uh, the general uh, uh, aggregation equation for anisotropic GCN. The only difference with the previous one is that you have this function, which depends on the central norm i and the neighbors i. And this will, 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 will be different depending of, on, on your neighbor. Okay? So this function can be learned. Uh, for example, here, uh, this function is the softmax uh, attention over the neighborhood of uh, the node i. And the edge that you have here are learned. Okay, so here this is, um, you know, in modern in modern uh, NLP language, this is the query and this is the key. Okay, so since we are not too far from transformer, what I would like to mention is that in the case of transformer, uh, the neighborhood here that the softmax uh, here, the neighborhood, uh, is done on the whole graph. Okay. So we don't use any particular graph structure with transformer. Everything is connected to everything. Um, then GCN benefits uh, strongly from batch normalization and residual connection. And it comes almost for free. Uh, so you take your favorite uh, GCN, aggregation function, then you use batch normalization and you do residual connection. And it, re it is really helpful. You speed up learning process and you improve performance with better generalization. How do you batch graphs with different sizes? What we do is that we first build this um, sparse block diagonal matrix, and each block is basically one graph, one adjacency graph. And then you do batch normalization along the node uh, direction. Uh, GCN leverage uh, graph sparsity. So remember, for NLP, we don't have any um, uh, you know, topology. Everything is connected to everything. But the topology is very important, right? So we, we, we want to leverage this uh, topology to um, because it's a very good inductive bias for generalization. Uh, local computation, so all the computation you see uh, are, are, are local and independent of the graph size. Okay? And so it means that this is highly parallelizable on GPU. And you have modern um, you know, uh, uh, GNN libraries like a DGL, uh, PyTor geometric, and spectral. So at the workshop, there will be Zhang Zhang and Matthias Fay that will talk about them that really uh, did. Um, a wonderful job for as efficient implementation of GNNs. OK, um, so the second class of GNNs I'm going to talk is on the Weiss failure Lehman GNNs. So the motivation here is to characterize the expressivity power of GNNs with respect to the graph isomorphism. So graph isomorphisms means that if you have two graphs like this, so the graph number one, the graph number two, actually, these two graphs are topologically equivalent. They are the same. Okay? So even if we have a different indexing for the fluorine atom, which is one here, 
and five year, we can find a mapping of the index um, that will match this topology to this topology here. Okay, so these two graphs are, are the same. The thing is, it's we don't have an efficient algorithm. Uh, we, we don't know actually if there is an exact algorithm, you know, to, to check if two graphs are isomorphic. So Weisweiser and Lehman, they proposed an algorithm to test if two graphs are, are not uh, isomorphic. Uh, at the core of this test, um, you're going to have an injective coloring function. So this um, coloring function will take the color of the central node and the color of the neighbors and will create a new color. So you will apply this function iteratively and get no new color are created. And then you will get a canon canonical representation of a graph in terms of colors, histogram of colors. If the two histograms of, of colors are different, then the two graphs are not isomorphic. Um, so the question now is, can we uh, design a, a graph neural network as expressive as a W test to distinguish non-isomorphic graphs? So that was, you know, the goal of, uh, of Gene, so the graph isomorphic in the network. And, 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 and then it's possible to do it if you have a node aggregation equation of this form, where G is an injective function, sum is, an, is, a, is also an injective operator, and, and epsilon is irrational. Okay, so it's not easy to define um, an analytical injective function G, but we can use MLP to, to approximate it. Okay, it's guaranteed by the universal uh, approximation theorem that it exists such a uh, function G. Okay, so we have uh, an MLP here. Then this is, this is uh, the node uh, update equation. Then we can define a readout, uh, graph readout function, and it, it, it also must be injective. So you, you still use, again, the, the sum uh, function. So at the end, this is what Gene is doing. So if you have uh, this graph, it's going to map this graph uh, to a space of k dimension. If you have another graph, which is isomorphic to this graph, then this will be mapped to the same point in the k-dimensional space. If you have another graph, which is non-isomorphic, then it will be mapped to a point which is different. Okay. So this is a pioneering work with the, the work of, um, of, of Morris on GNN uh, expressivity. Okay, so there is, however, some limitation with the, w, with the original W test. It is not a sufficient condition. So sometimes you have, you know, um, graphs, which are not isomorphic, but will produce exactly the same color signature, okay? And the same also for these graphs. So, um, so can we improve the expressivity of the original W test? And, and if you look at, you know, how we define the original W test, basically we use two tuples of nodes to produce colors, okay? So we use edges, I and J, for example. So if we want to produce more colors and be more discriminative, then what we need to do is to uh, use k tuples of nodes with k larger than three. So you, you're going to use um, hyper uh, edges like uh, i, g, r, for example. So two tuple of nodes can, dis can, can distinguish non-isomorphic graphs with a 1w or 2w test. Three tuple of nodes can distinguish non-isomorphic graphs with the 3w test. Okay, so now the question is how do we design a graph neural network as uh, expressive as the KW test. So it was defined by the uh, by equivalent uh, GNN, um, by Lipman and his collaborators. So, so basically, you're going to have, you know, your input um, signal, and then you're going to have, you know, um, uh, equivalent, equivalent linear layers, then you're going to have uh, invariant layers. So all these uh, layers are invariant by index permutation. And then you're going to take, you know, k is going to be the maximum order of this tensor inside the, the inside this neural network. And then there is a theorem that say it exists a k order um, a GNN that can distinguish non-isomorphic graphs with a kW test. So this is this is great. However, it's not practical because k order um, uh, equivalent GNN requires, you know, um, tensor tense tensor uh, of order k. Okay, so. So, and the thing is, um, if you want to beat GNN in, with respect to the discriminative power, which is uh, 2WL, then you need at least k equal to 3. So it means that you, you need a cubic, you know, um, complexity. So this is quite a lot. Um, so the question was uh, how to design GNN that are 3WL expressive, but do not require uh, n cube uh, memory complexity. So uh, Lipman and his collaborators introduced uh, uh, a GNN to do that by multiplying second order tensor. 
together. So n square uh, uh, memory uh, requirement. And um, but when you multiply two matrices of n square size, then the 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 speed complexity is going to be n cube. Okay. Along, along this, um, this work, there is also a related method, which is the ring GNN by Bruna and his collaborators. And, and this, is, um, this has the same flavor. So we want here to multiply uh, equivalent linear layers to achieve higher interactions between the nodes. OK, so we have a hierarchy of expressivity with respect to the WL test. Here you have the Mitch by SYN GCN. Uh, here you have Gene. And here you have the 3 WL test and the ring GNN test. OK, Grafano CGNN, so this is our uh, baseline. Basically, when we don't use any graph structure, we want to be sure that, um, that uh, I mean, when we use graph structure, we want to be sure that we do better than having no graph structure. OK, data sets. So again, the main issue is the small sizes. What are the ideal data sets? So they are, must be representative, realistic, medium, large scale size. And actually, this is very challenging to have all these requirements because uh, how do you define the quality of a data set and also its representativeness? And you also have arbitrary choices. For example, if you do e-commerce, uh, what are the, the features you're going to use to define a product and, and the appropriate size? So when, when is large good enough? Um, you know, it depends on the task complexity and the, and the statistic of your data. So, um, so the recent uh, Open Graph benchmark project is a much needed initiative to tackle these challenges. So Yuri Leskolek will give a, a talk about this at the, at, the, at the workshop. So the proposed data set, uh, for us, the requirement of the data set was that uh, we want this data set to statistically separate the performance between GNNs. That was really our, uh, our objective. So we, we have basically medium-sized um, data set between 0 0.27 million to 7 million in total number of nodes. And we cover the four. Um, fundamental graph tasks, which are graph regression, graph classification, node classification, and in prediction. Um, so the proposed task, so we use Zinc. So Zinc is a, is a real-world molecular data set. Uh, and we regress the constraint uh, solubility, uh, which is an important chemical property when we want to design uh, better GNN, uh, better, better molecules. Uh, we also use MNIST and CIFAR, which are classical image classification data sets. Um, that we convert to graphs using superpixel. And for us, they are sanity uh, checks. Uh, as we expect, you know, to be close to 100% for MNIST and to do well enough for CIFAR. And then we do node classification task uh, by using the stochastic block models, which is widely used um, to model communities in social networks. Uh, here we have two data sets. The first one is cluster. So we want to identify, you know, communities. And for each community, we give only one label. And we have also pattern. So basically, we have a pattern uh, that, uh, with some feature that we embed in a, higher, in a larger graph. And we want to recognize it. So this is the basic you know, um, subgraph recognition task. Uh, then we have also CSL. So this is to test the exclusivity of GNN. It was introduced by Rimero and his colleagues. Um, so uh, they are really highly regular graphs. And you want to be able to uh, classify non-isomorphic graphs. Uh, we also have uh, the traveling salesman problem uh, for the link prediction. So basically, uh, this is the TSP solution, and you want to be able to product to uh, to predict, you know, link um, inside the solution. We also use uh, one data set from uh, OGB, which is Collab. This is also a link prediction data set, and the goal is to predict, um, you know, future collaboration between scientists. Uh, so for the infrastructure, quickly, so we have a GitHub repo for that. And our objectives was really to make it as easy as possible, uh, modular. And we have rigorous and fair you know, experimental uh, comparison. And this, this infrastructure is built um, on uh, PyTorch and uh, DGN, so Deep Graph Library. Uh, for the experimental settings, so uh, for the data splits, uh, either it is given to us, or we, or we do a random split uh, for the other data sets. For the training, we use a DAM optimizer and the same learning rate decay strategy for all GNNs. So we compare fairly. Um, for the statistics, we use four different seats and we report you know, mean and standard deviation. For the parameter budget, so our goal was not to find you know, the optimal 
uh, set of hyperparameters. Uh, we don't have the computational uh, resources. And I think also what we wanted is to not to find, you know, um, you know, the best model for, for this data set. We wanted to have, to identify, you know, some good principles of building good architectures. Um, so we decided to have two parameter budgets. So 100K parameters with uh, four layers, 500K parameters with 16 layers, and then we adapt the number of hidden features uh, to fit, you know, the, the budget. Okay, so let me talk about benchmarking uh, results. So uh, here are the results. It's a big table. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to summarize uh, uh, the, the results of this experiment. So result number one is that, so the message passing GCN outperform um, the WGNN on all data sets. Potential reasons are, um, so the memory and speed requirement is um, quadratic and cubic. So it's, it can explain why you, do, you cannot scale to medium size. And actually, if you look at Zinc, which is the data set with the smallest graph sizes between nine and 37 nodes, then this is where the WGNN performed the best. And I think, yeah, uh, this is also an early stage of development of WGNN. The result number two, um, so message passing GCN, they benefit strongly from batch normalization and residual connection. It really boosts performance. It really accelerates training. Um, that's, that's, that's very convenient. For the WGNN, uh, we were not able to, to use, um, I mean, we, we use residual connection, but the performance was, was not improved. And actually, performance is degraded for residual connection. For batch normalization, uh, we cannot do it uh, because batch implementation is done in a, uh, with a gradient accumulation uh, approach. So it's not clear how you do it. So instead, we try to do layer normalization, which is independent of the batch. And, and, and again, the performance is degraded. The result number three, so anisotropic mechanism uh, improve isotropic GCN. So uh, sparse attention, uh, you know, coming from um, Badano, uh, or dense attention um, are not injective. So uh, they are not as powerful as gene, but still experiments show that they are good at generalization. Uh, so intuitively, you, f you see that softmax attention is flexible to represent max, mean, and weighted mean with respect to conceptual information, like in NLP. So it's, it's, it's something powerful in NLP. It's also something powerful for graphs. And recent works um, studied effectiveness of global attention for, for generalization. OK, now I'm going to talk about positional encodings. So first, I'm going to uh, talk about structural versus positional encodings. So structural encodings comes from the GCN representation. So GCN, like genes, they are not able to differentiate isomorphic nodes. So they are nodes with the same neighborhood structure. So for example, if you look at the fluorine uh, atom here, it has the same um, representation as this, uh, as this uh, atom here. Okay, because the two nodes are uh, isomorphic. The same also for nitrogen. They are the same representation. Also, these two hydrogens are the same representation. These two hydrogens are also the same representation. So this is a limitation of the expressivity of GCN. So can we break this structural symmetry? Yes, we can do that if we use higher order WHGNN, but then you will have to use a dense uh, tensor. Or you can use positional encoding of nodes with linear complexity. Okay, so what are the good properties of positional encodings? So you want a unique representation for each node, and you want this to be distance sensitive. So nodes that are far apart should have different positional features, and nodes which are close by should have similar positional features. Uh, one thing uh, uh, which, is, which is a limitation of positional encoding is that uh, you cannot sign a canonical representation of positional encoding because of the graph symmetries. And let me explain you that. So let's say, I come back with my, with my molecular graph here. So, uh, so the, the, this, fluor, uh, this fluorine um, atom and this fluorine atom here, so they are both, um, you know, uh, stru they are structurally symmetric. Okay. So if you, if you decide to assign uh, a position on encoding of A for, for this node and position encoding of B for this node, actually, it's completely arbitrary. You can, you can decide you know, to switch them. So it can be B here and A here. It's not going to change anything. So position and encoding are always arbitrary up to the number of graph symmetries. 
So the simplest position reckoning you can do is the order is to use the ordering of the nodes among n factorial possible uh, ordering. Okay, so this is one of possible ordering, uh, you know, seven, two, six, eight, and so on. And then there is a theorem by um, uh, by Ribeiro and his uh, and his and his colleagues uh, that you can improve the expressivity of gene uh, by using um, all permutation of possible ordering. Of course, you cannot do that in practice. So during training, you are going to um, use, uh, you know, uh, different orderings by uniformly sampling from the n factorial possible choices, because you want your network, your network to be, uh, to learn to be independent with respect to these arbitrary choices. Uh, okay, so we introduce Laplacian, um, Laplacian position encoding. So this is the graph um, normalized uh, Laplacian, and here this is the eigen decomposition, and you are the Laplacian eigen vectors. So this is a uh, an hybrid positional and structural uh, encoding, invariant by index permutation. Um, this is unique and distance sensitive, so this is good. But the Laplacian uh, position encoding have also some symmetries um, uh, with respect to the sign of the eigenvectors. So you can, you, you can flip the sign of the eigenvector and you will not change the eigen decomposition. Okay? Um, the number of possible sign flips is 2 to the power k, and k is the number of eigenvectors. In practice, we choose k to be much smaller than the number of nodes in your graph. So it means that the space of sampling, uh, 2 to the power k, is much smaller than the space of sampling of index position encoding, which is n factorial. So, but still during training, we will need the eigenvector to be, we will need the sign of the eigenvector to be randomly flipped. Uh, among the 2 to the power k possibilities, such that the network will learn to be independent with respect to these arbitrary choices. Um, and finally, so the Laplacian position encoding are interesting because they are graph generalization of transformer positional encoding, so it gives some, some light also uh, about transformers. Uh, okay, they are the numerical results. Um, so here CSL was designed by, um, by Ribeiro and his colleagues, so they are really highly structured, uh, you know, uh, highly regular uh, graphs, and, and if you don't use any, um, you know, positional encoding, then, then you, you will not do good. But if you use the Laplacian position encoding, so you will get uh, almost 100%, uh, you know, of, of accuracy. Uh, we improve a little bit pattern, but here cluster is improved a lot, uh, of course, because uh, we know that the eigenvectors um, are strongly related to the, uh, to the clusters, so of course you will have some improvements. Uh, we improve it a bit collab and zinc uh, has a lot of you know uh, natural symmetries so Laplacian eigenvector help a lot you know to improve performance okay uh, now I'm going to talk about link prediction so GCN may fail the link prediction task so let's say we have this molecular graph which is composed of two identical compounds okay if you apply any GCN what will happen is that again because these nodes are isomorphic um, they will produce the same representation, okay? So this fluorine will have the same representation of this one, and this hydrogen will have the same representation as this one. So when you want to perform link prediction, let's say, for example, there exists a bond between, between these two atoms. And you want, to, of course, to predict a bond between the two atom, atoms as well. So you will be able to do that. But at the same time, you will also predict wrong links between this atom and this atom here, because because uh, you know they have the same representation, and also between this atom and this atom here. So again, you have some symmetry that you want to break. Okay, so how do you make you know expressive GCN for the link prediction task? So it was proposed by uh, Ribeiro and Srini uh, Vassan. Basically, you want if you want to maximally expressive, you need to have a joint representation of nodes, and the joint representation of basically is going to encode the distances uh, between nodes. Um, so the thing is that it will really require, you know, n square edge representation. So, for example, um, uh, you can see. Let's say, for example, that the edge representation is the shortest path uh, distance on graph. So, so the distance between this atom and this atom is going to be uh, one two. It's going to be two. But the distance between this atom and this atom is going to be uh, one two three four five. Okay. So you see that you break the symmetry by using, uh, you know. Uh, distances between uh, between nodes. Uh, so what we what we suggest is uh, instead of using n square, we can use you know uh, 
the number of edges by just using, uh, for example, Laplacian position encoding, which will give you, uh, again, uh, a good distance between, uh, between the nodes. Also, what we wanted to, to check is the impact of having a joint representation of nodes when you do link prediction. Is it, is it something that we, um, that, that we can see, you know, in, in the experiments? So what we did is that we, we try, you know, three variations. So the first variation is having no joint representation. The second, the second, the, the second um, option is to have an implicit edge representation, which is here. And, and the last uh, version is to have an explicit edge representation. And you can see that, so for the TSP and collab link prediction, that when you go from no link, uh, no joint representation to joint representation, then you increase sig significantly the performance uh, of, your, of your model. So yes, we need, we need uh, joint representation when we want to perform uh, you know, link prediction with GCN. OK, so as a conclusion, my take home messages are um, uh, message passing GCN outperform uh, WN, uh, GNN, uh, G, uh, GNN for genes, uh, 3WN and, and RIG, uh, RIG GNN on the A data set using this benchmark. Uh, message passing GCN benefit from graph sparsity, universal building blocks like batch normalization and residual connection, Anisotropic mechanism improve isotropic GCN. Laplacian eigenvectors improve index positional encodings. And edge representation with positional encodings enhance link prediction. So there has been, now the community um, understand, you know, the, um, uh, the limitation with WL GNN, with the, the dense tensor, and we should use, you know, uh, graph sparsity. So there has been some recent works also uh, presented at this workshop uh, to improve uh, the efficiency of uh, WL uh, techniques. But I think what will be very important again is to be sure that the theory is going to match, you know, practical performances and we will be able to do that with benchmarking. Um, so just maybe uh, a workshop announcement for, um, for next year at IPAM. So we're organizing a workshop on deep learning and combinatorial optimization and we invite you to participate to this, uh, to this workshop. And I want uh, to, again to thank um, uh, everyone for um, for your attention. Thank you very much.